Welcome to EPG Paatshala. I'm Dr. Swati Biswas from the Department of Islamic History and Culture, University of Calcutta. Today we are going to discuss from the paper Economic History of India, the module Delhi Sultanate, Agrarian Taxation and the Currency System. To the main objective of this paper is to know the evolution of the tax system introduced by the Delhi Sultanate, the implementation of the new tax system, and the features of the currency system that the Delhi Sultanate had and the types of coins and their values. Let us introduce the subject by saying initially that there is no reference which clearly states as to how the agricultural surplus was appropriated by the state before the Ghorians came. It is difficult to ascertain how it was exacted from the primary producer in the form of the landowner's claim or as taxes. The inscription gives the name of a number of taxes, but whether it was claimed as taxes or as the landowner's claim for the land is not known. The nature of it, it definitely there is an ambiguity. The share of the produce is all the more difficult to ascertain. In the initial phase of the Delhi Sultanate, the, there was not much change in the older system. The older system existed on which the new rulers superimposed their demands. The ruling class of the older system paid the demands as tributes. In the rebellious areas or the rebellious territories of the Mawasats, such arrangements could not be made. So what happened was there was these places were raided and it directly the taxes were collected from the peasants. The system of tribute did not work in this part of the state. The situation then was congenial for them to introduce regular tax based on the Islamic law to which the rulers were familiar. By the end of 13th century, it must have been introduced in and around Delhi for sure. This process has not been recorded in the history. The recorded part starts with the time of Alauddin Khalji when a large part of North India was brought under the regulation of a uniform taxation. The regulation of Alauddin Khalji is something that has been recorded by historians like Ziauddin Barani and later even uh, by the other historians. The decree of Alauddin Khalji clearly states that the peasantry had to pay three taxes. They had to pay the Karaz or Karaz e Zizia, which was a tax on the cultivation or Zarat. The secondly, there was Charai, which was a tax on the milch cattle, and the third was Gharai or the taxes on houses. Kharaj had to be paid by all engaged in cultivation. So what Alauddin Khalji brought about the changes, he also introduced these taxes to the uh, to the elite of the rural uh, rural class. So there was a problem in exaction because the leaders in the villages or the rural elites were not in a habit to pay taxes. There was a provision of measurement or mahasad and fixation of the yield per biswa per wafa e biswa. Without any exception, the amount was 50% of the produce. The land cultivated under each crop was measured. The yield was estimated per unit of area. And then it was multiplied in the area in the form of yield and the total produce had to be worked out then. Later, this system came to be called Kankut. And remember, the Kankut system worked up to the time of the Mughals, at least in their initial years. The fixed amount in kind could be converted to cash. As per state instruction, the collectors insisted for the payment immediately and the peasants had to sell their product due to this reason straight away. And therefore, we can understand that the market did not give the high value to the peasants and the subsidy the subsistence amount to the peasants were very low. The payment was expected in cash. This expedited the process in many folds. But of course, it was in the favor of the state and not in the favor of the peasants. 
Alauddin Khalji only insisted on payment in kind and actually referred to Khalisa land or the land where, which was acquired by the state itself and that those lands were definitely near the capital. It act covered the Doab region or the region which was close to the center. The tax system stretched from Dipalpur and Lahore in Punjab to Kara and Katihar in Uttar Pradesh in the eastern zone and from Nagar and Chain in Rajasthan. The system was made rigorous and popular but surely it was not new in all the areas. The revenue was imposed on all the cultivators thus the headmen the courts and the mukaddams were not spared according to Ziauddin Barani. This was difficult to do in practice because the caste-based social structure but of course in certain parts of the state definitely this system worked and it is believed that courts and mukaddams were pauperized because of this system. The tax itself was very regressive and did not save the lower rung of the peasantry. So the tax system always went in favor of the state and did not look into the good goodwill of the peasants. All the state could do was to ensure that their own share and prevented the rural leader from further exploitation. So this one can say was a relief to the peasants. This system of tax collection survived for long and was a basis of tax system till the 19th century. Thus from this time the land tax became the principal form in which the peasant surplus was expropriated from the, for the, by the ruling class. Now let's move into the tax regulations of the Toglaks. Toglaks brought about an um, immense change in the system for, from the former time. Gyazandi and Tolak tried to modify the system by giving some relaxation to courts and mukaddams. It was understood that the center did not have the capacity to collect the tax directly and it had to depend on the courts and the mukaddams in the villages. He insisted though that Kismati Koti or the tax that was levied by the courts and mukaddams on the peasants will not be imposed but they themselves were exempted from giving any tax on the cultivation or cattle that is Karaz and and the taxes on the milch. Now these concessions were given to them so that they again took up the duty of collecting tax on behalf of the state. He also relieved the peasantry from giving extra cesses levied on the sown lands. Mohammed bin Toglak brought the whole area of Gujarat, Malwa, Deccan, South India and Bengal under the same sack system prevailing in the Dwab region. This was a revolutionary change in the tax system. Now, uniform for the first time, a uniform tax system could prevail over such a big large area in, in the subcontinent was something new even to the peasants. In the second phase, the Sultan attempted a substantial enhancement of the scale of this agrarian taxation. This was a big blunder. True chroniclers give two information. Barani said that the new additional impost was levied on the peasants, that is the abwab. On the other hand, Yaha says that the three major taxes were more vigorously assessed and collected. But in any way, we can understand the tax system went through a modification in favor of the state. In reality, what happened was the yield that was calculated or converted to price was done on an ad hoc basis and not on the actual figure. The official account was thus much inflated. This resulted in an uprisings in many areas of Dwab and Bengal. We have to understand that these rebellions were led by none other than the courts and the Mukaddams who faced a grave crisis because of the increased tax system. The rebellion, in spite of the brutal methods of suppression, simmered. The crisis became even more acute in the areas of Delhi and the entire Dwab because of a famine.
The rains failed and the crisis became more and more acute, according to Ziauddin Barani. The famine began in 1334-35 and continued for about more than seven years. This calamity was blamed in its initial stage to the hike in the tax system. This led to a very important observation, a very pertinent one to the medieval time, that is the relation between the land revenue and agricultural production. This led again to the observation by the economic historians that Mohammed bin Toglak, whose increased land revenue provoked agrarian rebellion and that again led to the disruption of agriculture and fall in the production level, was responsible for systematic policy of promotion of agriculture. So the center understood that if there is not a national policy through which agriculture progress is made, then the income of the state would fall. As an immediate relief, therefore, of the famine, he extended loans, which were called sondhars, to for the cultivation and to dig wells. So these were pre-harvest rolls, loans, which were again uh, extended from time to time. These kinds of loan during the Mughal period came to be called Takhavis and Takhavis remained uh, in, in the Indian subcontinent till the advent of the British. In recorded history of India, Mohammed bin Tuluk is the first Indian ruler to have used this device to promote cultivation on a large scale. He remained in Delhi till 1346-47 and conceived a great plan to improve cultivation and extend the area under agriculture. He even formed a department of agriculture called Diwani Abiri Kohi. Almost 100 shikdars were, or officials were appointed to plan uh, in the plan to work for agriculture. Whatever was being cultivated was changed. So uh, the land for, uh, for uh, barley would go for rice, the ones which were for sugarcane would go for grape. So there was an attempt for a higher kind of a, a cultivation degree in all the crops. Siraj Afif confirmed that the loan money never came back. So this was again a setback, an economic setback for the Toglaks. Feroz Toglak wrote off all the loans, creating huge loss for the empire. And this set the cause for its decline to some extent. So the policy that was taken by uh, Muhammad bin Toglak was disbanded by Feroz Toglak because he had to get hold of the politics of the time. The crux of this venture was that Muhammad bin Toglak ensured that revenue would only increase if the agricultural land expanded and improved crops are sown instead, uh, improved crops are sown instead of the inferior one. It also led to the idea that the revenue earned should also be invested to get back a higher revenue for future. Firoz Dolak not only abandoned the grant project of his predecessors, but moved back to the fiscal con uh, concessions. He abolished agrarian cesses like Muhaddisat, Kismat, and Abwab. According to Siraj Zafif, he limited the exaction above uh, to something around 4%. He also forbade the levy of gharai and charai. We have to understand that this reduced the income of the state which stopped expanding. The sources say that jizya or the poll tax on Hindus was levied. But of course we have to understand there is no record which confirmed this issue. This became a sec separate tax. To according to some of the historians from this time. This rep perhaps replaced Gharai according to some scholars and both the taxes were exempted from, uh, for, from women and children. Firuz took a tax on water known as haq e sharb from the villages which use canal water. We have to understand that in many areas from Delhi to Hisar, Firuz uh, 
introduced the canal system which was again uh, in favor of the state and which was a direct income of the state. This amounted to one-tenth of the produce. The information regarding taxation post Feroz Thokluk becomes scanty. The tax was definitely collected but not anymore by the central authority. That tax was collected now by the rural, uh, local rulers or hereditary claimants. So the tax system of the center was perhaps disbanded after the Tughlaqs. A record from the time of the Lodi suggests that the prices fell so low that the tax had to be collected in kind instead of cash. The extent of this system in North India, of course, is not known. This could have resulted from the scarcity of the supply of silver for a long time. We have to understand that India never produced silver and it also had to depend on the import of it. So this import uh, really uh, balance became low, so low that there was no better currency system on which the whole system depended. The scarcity of minted money made things worse as the peasants may not have the provision to sell the crops in the market. The influx of silver from the new world should have changed the scenario, but this did not change before the advent of Sher Shah, that is around in the mid 16th century when the cash nexus was restored back and a perfect, again, a standardized currency system was introduced. Now, there is a definitely a relationship between the agrarian taxation and the currency system. Now, let us move to the currency system of the Delhi Sultanate. The advent of Delhi Sultanate is marked by the introduction of a new kind of numismatics. Uh, in the initial phase, the old coins were used and of course the minting of the coins were initially given to the Hindu sonar caste who were traditionally efficient in this task. Thus in the charge of the Delhi Mint, it is recorded during Qutubuddin or Mubarak uh, by someone called Thakera Feru, whose account in Upper Vrangsha is very useful as a source of economic history of Delhi Sultan in its earlier phase. Silver initially was scarce. The Delhi Sultans depended on the silver currency of the Chandras, which came from Bengal. Of course, this quality of the silver was not good. The initial Sultans even inscribed the term as a conqueror of Bengal as an evidence of the treasures that Bengal supplied in the forms of the coins. The coinage system that developed was very much Indian and was not an imitation of the Islamic prototype. The decision to mint gold and silver coins in the initial phase was a very, very important uh, decision. And of course, it hints at a at movement towards a stabilized economy. The earliest issues gold coins and silver coinage from Delhi was commemorative in nature and reflected the immediate coinage hoards plundered or remitted in the tribute. The remonetization of the economy occurred from the 13th century. The 14th century account says that the troopers with one horse was paid 234 tankas. So we can understand the whole military was somehow had to be supplied with the money that was minted. And this trooper would get another, another 78 tankas if he could maintain a second horse. So the amount itself was large. In the monetary system of the gold and silver coins of Delhi Sultanate, a firm equation between gold and silver was stroked at 1 is to 10. The plunder of the Hindu kingdoms and the temples also supplied huge silver and gold. The fluctuation between the metals is not seen, but in case of scarcity, the metals simply disappeared. The prevalent coin in North India in the 12th century and the early 13th century was the bull and horseman type of coins of the Hindu Shahi rulers of Kabul and Vaihind. These coins even spread up to Rajasthan and North Central India. Iltutmish standardized the silver coins and reduced the silver content by half. Now, with 
this reduction, of course, the coin became very popular. The coin was called Jital and it weighed about 32 ratis. The silver in this coin was 2 ratis and the other value of the silver to copper was in the ratio 1 is to 80. And the Jital changed to 148th of the silver tanka in North India during the high time of the Delhi Sultanate and 150th in the Deccan after the Muslims uh, conquered or rather uh, took over Devagiri during the Toglak period. The difference was due to the fact that the prices of copper was higher in South India where it was imported from the overseas market. The smaller money was dangs and dirhams. One silver tanka was around 48 jital which equated to 192 dangs and that again would equate to something around 480 dirhams. The, silver, uh, the Delhi Sultanate depended heavily on the supply of gold and silver from Bengal too. Gil gold in Bengal is recorded to be imported from China. The import of silver to Bengal was not reported anywhere. So therefore it is uh, of an ambiguity as to where so much of silver could have come to the Bengal hoods. The plunder if Deccan Kingdom supplied precious metal to the empire. So uh, the, uh, the Khaljis and the Toglaks both attempted to move to south because of these plunders and these plunders in return would bring back huge amount of silver and uh, gold to North India. The supply uh, of gold was more than silver in India at one point of time, at least in the 15th, 16th century. It is informed by Farishta that in this, uh, who was a 16th, uh, 17th century historian that Alauddin in 13th century looted 7.7 .7 metric tons of gold and 12.8 tons of silver from Devagiri. But of course, there is no firm record which could support this view. Malik Kafur's plunder, that is, during the time of Alauddin Khalji of the Pandya Kingdom, brought back about 96,000 mons of gold. Now, it may be an exaggeration, but to some extent true, that it brought huge amount of gold as to the center. The Tughlaqs also looted a huge amount of gold and silver from South India especially during the time of Muhammad bin Toglak. Quality of the coins was instantly improved with the advent of this amount of silver and gold. The coins issued by Alauddin Khalji was brighter than the ones that was earlier minted in Bengal, uh, proving that the amount of lead was much low in these coins. The gold coin during the time provided the large surplus that was needed. The plunder of Timur in the 14th century records that the tankas issued by Alauddin Khalji were in huge amount and this must have attracted, apart from Timur, many of the conquerors. The monetary innovation of Muhammad bin Toglak in 1325 dis uh, somehow disturbed the gold and silver rate and it also shook the balance between the gold and silver. The token currency of copper and brass was also a failure and it caused great disruption of commerce which is recorded in the accounts of from Gujarat and North India. The issuance of gold coin later did prove that the treasury was not emptied but there was an acute shortage of silver coins. This was aggravated by the political laws of Bengal by the Delhi Sultanate. The silver coinage of Bengal Sultans was noteworthy. North India was again replenished by silver coins after the conquest of Bengal by Sher Shah which happened in the mid 16th century. Bengal was supplied silver by, as it has been discussed, by the overland trade. Burma and Tibet via Nepal were also the other sources to, uh, to, of the silver to Bengal. The literary sources confirm that Delhi sultans made demand of silver coins from Bengal.
The revenue collection was insisted by the collector of the Toglats was made in silver in Bengal. So therefore that Bengal was a supplier of silver for a long time to Delhi has been confirmed. The surviving evidence shows that during Mohammed bin Toglak, there was an acute shortage of silver coins compared to the gold coins. The situation became all the more acute during Feroz Shah Tolbek. During Bengal expedition in 1359, uh, Feroz Shah insisted on the collection of the revenue from the Hindu chiefs of Gorakhpur in silver. The famous go, uh, uh, brooch hoard of the late 14th century also reveals that there were 1,200 silver coins from Western Asia, the West Asia, but there were no silver tankas from Delhi Sultanate. So there was a huge scarcity and West where the West Asian uh, silver was much in use. The monetary system of the 13th century by the Muslim rulers decayed in the 14th century. In 1330, a debased 10 rati billion tanka replaced the silver tanka of pure silver. Interestingly though, Ibn Battuta gave the list of prices in the terms of pure silver tanka in the following decade, which is again a confusing uh, fact in constructing the history of the currency system of this time. In Bengal, the denomination of silver tanka were cowries. It was widely used in the whole part of eastern India. The use of coins on a large scale again started in the middle of the 16th century when the monetization came back in full swing. In the other parts of Muslim dominated India, silver and gold coins ceased to become the medium of exchange. Rather, they were used for ceremonial purposes and to proclaim sovereignty. The 15th century saw the use of mixed metal currency of copper in scanty admixture of silver as a standard currency of trade. The Lodhis lastly issued few silver and gold coins. Wasif, a 14th century Persian historian, saw India as a drain of gold. Uh, he also recorded that the, how much of gold was imported by uh, India. But of course, the record cannot be confirmed. The Eurasian uh, countries as well as the gold miner face West Asia supplied gold to India. From medieval Ghana, huge amount of gold passed to Western Europe and to the Eastern trade through the Mamluk Kingdom. Again, referring back to the brooch hoard, it is important to notice that the import of precious metal into the territories from uh, to India from the West. The largest quantity of gold and silver came from the Mamluk dynasties of Egypt and Syria. The Rasulid kingdom of Yemen also supplied coins. These balanced the trade of food crops and cotton cloth to South Arabia. The Venetian coins proved the participation even of the European countries in the spice trade. The coins from Persian Gulf or Persia, of course, are rare. So it is believed that some kind of an exchange uh, perhaps took place in case of trade or perhaps there was not much trade during this time with the Persian Gulf or Persia for that matter. This trend indicated that since India imported war horses, the balance of trade involved an export from India too. Ibn Battuta attests the fact that the drain of Indian riches towards Middle East, particularly towards Persian Gulf in the 15th century, happened due to the trade advances of Muhammad bin Toglak. Thus, it can be said that the political and economic trend of Delhi Sultanate was that it put the hoarded treasures that they captured during the expedition in circulation, which in went in favor of trade and commerce. Apart from their lavish consumption, they also used the hoarded treasures for their military use like import of war horses and well-trained fighters. So now let us summarize as to what we have discussed in this module. The stack system had an evolutionary character during Delhi Sultanate. There was an attempt to build a uniform tax system. 
the regional differences was too wide for a uniform taxation. The tax system induced cash nexus because the tax was, uh, was expected in cash. The currency system therefore was a noteworthy one. Standardized coins were the marker of this age and the smooth working of the tax system and the perfection of the currency system depended on this political situation in the capital. Thank you for this patient's listening and you can refer back to for further references in the e-text. Thank you.